Good evening. Go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14. And we will be reading verses 16 through 24. Luke 14, 16 through 24. This is Jesus speaking in a parable. And it says in verse 16 of Luke chapter 14. But he said to him, a man was giving a big dinner and he invited many. And at the dinner hour, he sent his slave to say to those who had been invited, come for everything is ready now. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first one said to him, I have bought a piece of land and I need to go out and look at it. Please consider me excused. Another one said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to try them out. Please consider me excused. Another one said, I have married a wife and for that reason I cannot come. And the slave came back and reported to this to his master. Then the head of the household became angry and said to his slave, Go out at once into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in here the poor and the crippled, the blind and lame. And the slave said, Master, what you have commanded has been done and still there is room. And the master said to the slave, Go out into the highways and along the hedges and compel them to come in so that the house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste of my dinner. Notice here in verse 18 that those who were invited to the dinner by this master who is giving a big dinner and he invited many, he's opening his house to them and feeding them with seemingly a great feast. And it says that all the people who were invited, they all alike began to make excuses and of course in this parable is the idea that the Jesus is the head of the house and uh, Jesus is inviting people into the kingdom but uh, there are people who Jesus was inviting who did not want to be part of the kingdom and as we think about that concept of wanting to be in the kingdom, I want to talk this evening about excuses. Excuses that people might make for why they don't want to follow Jesus. And they might say that uh, they do want to follow Jesus, but then they'll give this excuse, but I can't because of this reason. And I want to look at some of these excuses and really tell why they're not good excuses. And you may know someone who gives one of these excuses. You may yourself have an excuse like one of these for not wanting to follow Jesus, not wanting to enter the kingdom of God. And this is not to, to make fun of you or anything like that, but just to show that really we don't have any excuse for not following Jesus. Jesus is offering us something so much better than a big dinner, a big feast. He's offering us eternal life if we would just follow him. And so we ought to not make excuses, but rather follow him. But what are some of these excuses that someone might make to not follow Jesus? Well, one excuse that I've heard is it's not a convenient time. You turn over to Acts chapter 24. Acts chapter 24 for just a moment. Acts chapter 24 and in verse 24, Paul is in prison in Caesarea and Felix is the, the governor of that region. And it says, but some days later, Felix arrived with Drusilla, his wife, who was a Jewess, and sent for Paul and heard him speak about faith in Christ Jesus. But as he was discussing righteousness, self-control and the judgment to come, Felix became frightened and said, go away for the present. And when I find time, I will summon you. Some translations have Felix say, when there is a convenient time, I will summon you or I will call for you. And a lot of people make this excuse that really I want to follow Jesus, but right now is just not the time for me to do so. I've got so, so much going on in my life and, and, and I'm so busy and I, I've got my, my wife and my kids to think about. And... When I have more time, when I have a convenient time, then I will make that decision to follow Jesus. 
And to those people who are saying that it's not a convenient time to follow the Lord, I'd ask, do you know how much time you have left? Do you know that this is not the only time that you may have a chance to follow Christ? Turn with me to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. This is Jesus telling another parable. Matthew chapter 25 and verse 1. Then the kingdom of heaven will be comparable to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were prudent. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the prudent took oil and flask along with their lamps. Now while the bridegroom was delaying, they all got drowsy and began to sleep. But at midnight there was a shout, Behold, the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the prudent, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the prudent answered, No, there will not be enough for us and you too. Go instead to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they were going away to make the purchase, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast, and the door was shut. Later the other virgins came, also came, saying, Lord, Lord, open up for us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. And then Jesus gives his summation of the parable. Be on the alert then, for you do not know the day nor the hour. Now, a parable is, is a short story and the details given are really the details you need to focus on. But imagine that this was a real life scenario for a moment. Why would the, ten, why would the five virgins not bring oil for their lamps? Well, I would imagine that it would be for the sake of convenience. Maybe they didn't want to carry the extra burden. Uh, they're wanting to meet the bridegroom, and so I'm assuming that they're all prettied up. Maybe they're worried that uh, messing with oil is going to, to uh, run the risk of them getting dirtied up in some way. I, I, I don't really know uh, the reasons why you wouldn't bring oil, but they decided not to. And it didn't seem like it was forgetfulness, but rather a choice that was being made there. And so, of course, when the bridegroom comes at an unexpected hour, at midnight, the five prudent ones, they have oil and they're able to keep their lamps trimmed and, and keep their uh, lamps burning so that they can see. But the other ones, they don't have the oil and so they have to go off and buy. And then the bridegroom has come and they've missed their chance. They've missed that time to see the bridegroom. And so... As Jesus says, be on the alert then, for you do not know the day nor the hour. When we talk about the idea of following Jesus, it's not about convenience. Convenience is not necessarily the reason that we are following Jesus. In fact, there are many uh, things that Jesus says that gives us the idea that discipleship is not convenient. He says, if anyone wants to come after me, let him take up his cross daily and follow me. Let him deny himself. Let him hate father and mother and so on and so forth. Jesus talks about the cost of discipleship quite a few times. It's not about convenience, but rather discipleship and salvation is not a matter of convenience, but necessity. It's a matter of necessity. <coughs> And I thought of one particular instance in the New Testament that illustrates this. Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. We'll start reading in verse 25 in a moment. Paul and Silas have been put into prison for preaching the gospel. And they have been beaten and they, their feet have been fastened in stocks. But in verse 25, it says, but about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there came a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison house were shaken and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's chains were unfastened. When the jailer awoke and saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried out with a loud voice, saying, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. 
And he called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And after he brought them out, he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him together with all who were in his house. And he took them that very hour of the night and washed their wounds. And immediately he was baptized, he and all his household. And he brought them into his house and set food before them and rejoiced greatly, having believed in God with his whole household. So it's about midnight. The jailer is watching over the prisoners who are in the jail and it's dark and Paul and Silas are singing uh, hymns. The, the, the prisoners, it says they are listening to them. They're intrigued about these prisoners who are, are, are singing praises to their God while they're in prison. And then an earthquake happens and all the cells open and, and the chains are unfastened and the jailer's mind goes to... Con- he goes to complete disaster. He, he thinks that all the prisoners will have escaped. And under his charge, at, under Roman law, these prisoners under his charge, if he failed to keep his duty, his life was on the line. And so that is why he takes his sword and he's willing to take his own life in order to uh, not face the punishment of the Romans. But of course, Paul cries out and says, nobody's escaped. We're all here. You you should not do yourself any harm. And he's frightened. He's trembling. He he doesn't know what in the world is going on. But he calls for lights and he he falls down before Paul and Silas, uh, you know, practically on his face. And he says, what must I do to be saved? And I've said in times past, I don't know what he's asking here. Uh, he very met, he very well may uh, have heard in the hymns the God that uh, they were speaking to and maybe understood something about that. But maybe he's just asking, what do I do about this situation? But Paul and Silas tell him how to be saved. They talk to him about salvation in the gospel. They tell him about the salvation that matters, being a disciple of Jesus Christ. But I want you to think about the circumstances here. It's midnight. He's in charge of the prisoners. The jail cells are open. And they're telling him that he and his household need to believe in Jesus Christ and be baptized. The jailer very well could have said, well, right now it's not a very convenient time. Let me get to the end of my post, the end of my shift, and then I will obey the gospel. But that's not what happened, was it? He took them that very hour of the night and washed their stripes. And he took Paul and Silas, and Paul and Silas preached to to him and those who were in his house, and and they were all baptized. They were all became disciples of Christ. And he brought them in and he set food before them. He took care of their needs. It wasn't a convenient time for the jailer to think about discipleship for Christ. From a worldly perspective, he needed to focus on his job so that he could keep his head. But we see his priorities were in line. And there are so many other passages that we could go to to talk about convenient times. You might think of the Ethiopian eunuch who is uh, driving along the way to Ethiopia and just happens to see some water. Don't know how dirty it is. Don't know how deep it is. It's not necessarily a convenient time for him. The salvation is not a matter of convenience. It's a matter of necessity. We need salvation, as I talked about this morning. We need to be saved from our sins. And so we have to put convenience aside and realize that this is urgent. We would do so in a a physical emergency, wouldn't we? 
If we were, you know, making dinner for our family and, and all of a sudden one of our loved ones runs in and, and they have a serious wound and they need to go to the hospital to, to be stitch, stitched up or they're, they're going to bleed out and, and possibly die, would we say, well, I'm cooking dinner. Can't we wait till later? No, that's not what you would say. You would make it happen right then and there. Your salvation is even more important than that. Another excuse that people give, I've done too much. I've sinned too much to be forgiven. And to be honest, there are some people who are genuine who are, when they say this, and there are some people who are again kind of looking for a way out. But let me ask you, I'm about to read some passages and, and with these passages in the background, I want you to ask yourselves, are, are you as bad as these people that we're about to read about? 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And starting in verse 9. 1 Corinthians 6. Verse 9. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will in inherit the kingdom of God. Such were some of you, but you were washed. You were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of our God. Notice the list that Paul's giving out here. Fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, effeminate, homosexuals, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, swindlers. Not that sins need to be ranked, but as humans tend to do in ranking the sins, you would say a lot of those are at the top of the list, right at the tippy top. And yet Paul says to the Corinthians, such were some of you. They had done these things. They were guilty of these things. And yet Paul says that they were washed and they were sanctified and justified in the name of the Lord Jesus. That is, they had been forgiven of these sins. 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. And verse 12. 1 Timothy 1, verse 12, Paul says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has strengthened me because He considered me faithful, putting me into service, even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor. Yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus, it is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost of all. Paul talks about his former life, what he was before he turned to Jesus. He was a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a violent aggressor. At the very least, we know that he stood by and watched as Stephen was being murdered and he wholeheartedly agreed with it. But it's quite possible, I think likely, based on passages such as Acts chapter 8, or excuse me, Acts chapter 9 and verse 1, Saul still breathing threats and murders against the church. Paul was most likely a murderer of Christians. Now, a lot of people cannot say, I've killed somebody. And then again, not that we should rank sins, but if we're ranking them, murder goes right up, right up there at the top, doesn't it? For most people. Murdering innocent people goes even further than that. And yet, that's what Paul did. 
And he's, he calls himself the foremost of all sinners. He says, I'm the worst of the worst. Now again, ask yourselves, are you as bad as these people? Probably not. But even if you are, I want you to understand that it's not about how bad you are. It's about how good the Lord is. And you may not recognize that you're doing this when you say, I've done too much to be forgiving. But what you're doing is you're limiting the Lord. You're limiting His grace. You're limiting His love. You're limiting how good He is. That's what you're saying. Notice what Paul says in verse 14 of 1 Timothy 1. And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. Even for Paul, who was foremost of all among sinners, the grace of Jesus was more than abundant to take away his sin, to forgive him of his sin. We ought to understand that no matter what we've done, that the grace of the Lord is far better. The grace of the Lord is far more abundant. I mentioned from the pulpit before Jeffrey Dahmer, who it was a very famous serial killer and did horrible, unspeakable things. But according to, to public record and, and letters that he wrote uh, and, and letters that were written to him, it's very likely uh, that Jeffrey Dahmer was indeed baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of his sins. And it seems likely that he remained faithful unto his death. And so someone who has done such horrible things as that, I would submit that there's a real possibility that he may be with the Lord, that he may be in heaven. And again, that's not to belittle the things that he has done, but rather to show the abundant grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is capable of forgiving anyone. He is capable of forgiving you. Yes, even you. Another excuse that is often heard for not following Jesus, there are hypocrites in the church and I don't want to be around them. These hypocrites, they give me a bad taste in my mouth and they... they are mean to me and make me feel bad about myself and yet they go on and they sin. I've known people personally who have given this excuse for leaving the church and never coming back. When you think about this excuse, unfortunately it does not hold up. Not because it's not true. Although I would qualify by what in the church means. By meaning there are people who go to worship on Sundays. There are hypocrites among them. Absolutely. If we're talking about in the church, those who are saved. No, there are no hypocrites in those who are saved among Christ in the body of Christ. But yes, when you go to worship on Sundays, hopefully not here. But even if here, if there are hypocrites there, that should not dissuade you from being a Christian and from, uh, from assembling with the saints. Why not? Well, one reason is there are hypocrites everywhere. And by the same logic, if you're, you're going to say, well, I'm not going to go to church, I'm not going to follow Jesus because there are hypocrites there, then you need to be consistent and say, I'm not going to go anywhere where there's hypocrites. And that means, basically, you're staying home. Because guess what? There are hypocrites in your workplace. Are you going to stop working, stop making money? There are hypocrites when you go out to the store and, and you're, buying, you're, you're buying bread and milk and whatever else you're buying. There are hypocrites there at the store. You go to the gym and you work out. Guess what? There are hypocrites there. So 
Somebody might go to the gym and have a, a good long workout and then they go get a hot fudge, hot fudge Sunday afterward. Hypocrisy. I'm saying that a little bit tongue in cheek. But you get the idea, don't you? There are hypocrites everywhere. A hypocrite is someone who says one thing, says they are one thing, but they act completely opposite. And they are everywhere. So if you're going to not go where hypocrites are, just stay at home. And take a long look in the mirror because you yourself can be a hypocrite and not realize it too. But let me ask you this as well. What if Jesus had the same attitude? Turn with me to Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23 and verse 13. Jesus says, But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you shut off the kingdom of heaven from people, for you do not enter in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense you make long prayers. Therefore, you will receive greater condemnation. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you travel around on sea and land to make one proselyte. And when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. And he goes on to talk about the scribes and the Pharisees and how hypocritical they were. Jesus was around hypocrites a lot. And what if... When the Father sent Him to the earth to die for our sins, Jesus says, no, I am not going down to the earth to serve and to live a perfect life and to die on the cross there because there are hypocrites on the earth. There are hypocrites where you're sending me to Jerusalem and around that area. There are hypocrites. Well, if Jesus had that attitude, then you and I would be in a lot of trouble. And Jesus suffered harm by those hypocrites, did he not? Those hypocrites are the ones who had him tortured, put to death. Even if you go to worship, and even if there are hypocrites there, and even if they hurt you, think about what Jesus did for you what he was willing to endure. And consider that doing the right thing sometimes means that you're going to have to encounter evil people who are opposed to you. And you're going to have to overcome that. But another reason I would say that this excuse does not hold up, I would ask, are you following Jesus? Or are you following the people with whom you go to church? Who are you a disciple of? Are you a disciple of Christ? Or are you a disciple of Micah? Are you a disciple of Aaron? Are you a disciple of Bob? You ought to know the answer to that. You're following Jesus. In Ephesians chapter 1. In Ephesians chapter 1. And verse 22, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 22, Paul says, And he put all things, all things in subjection under his feet. That is, God the Father put all things in subjection under Christ's feet and gave Christ as head over all things to the church, which is Christ's body, which is His body, the fullness of Him who fills all in all. Christ is the head of the church. We follow Him. We don't follow the, the body. We listen to the head. 
And I'm reminded of the words of Jesus in John 21, where Peter is asking what's going to happen to the disciple John. Is he is he going to suffer and die, too, like you said, I am. And Jesus says, if I will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? In other words, don't be worried about what John does or what happens to John. He says, you follow me. There are hypocrites in the church, and so I'm not going to follow Jesus. No, no, no. What is that to you? If there are hypocrites in the church, what is that to you? You follow Jesus. It's not a good excuse. We need to think about our relationship to Jesus and how that's more important. <clears throat> than what other people do. Another excuse for not following Jesus is, well, I don't know enough. I don't know about, enough about the Bible. I, I'm new to this. And there is a lot of things that I feel like I have to learn before I become a disciple. When we look at conversions in the Bible, I want to ask you, I want to give you some examples of conver conversion and ask how much did these people know? For example, Acts chapter 8. <coughs> Acts chapter 8. And verse 30. This is the story of the conversion of the Ethiopian. Philip ran up and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and said, Do you understand what you are reading? And he said, Well, how could I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of Scripture which he was reading was this. He was led as a sheep to slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he does not open his mouth. In humiliation his judgment was taken away. Who will relate his generation? For his life is removed from the earth. The eunuch answered Philip and said, Please tell me, of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself or of someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning from this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. As they went along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? And Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he ordered the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. So Philip comes upon this Ethiopian, who is a proselyte of the Jewish religion, but he does not live in Judea. He is an Ethiopian, and he serves the Queen Candace. That means his residence is in Ethiopia. But he came to Jerusalem to worship. And it seems like he is very devoted to the scriptures and that he is reading. But he's reading Isaiah 53 and Philip asks him if he understands what he's reading. And he says, no, I don't. How can I unless someone guides me? <coughs> and as he's reading Isaiah 53, he doesn't understand if Isaiah is talking about himself or someone else. <coughs> And he asked Philip, who is he talking about? And beginning from that passage, it says that Philip began preaching Jesus to him. Now, we don't know exactly what the Ethiopian knew and didn't know in a lot of cases, but we can rule some things out, can't we? He didn't know what Isaiah 53 meant. He didn't know if it was talking about Isaiah or somebody else. By the way that it says that Philip preached Jesus to him, it doesn't seem like he knew a lot about Jesus either at this point. And that makes sense because he was an Ethiopian. He would not have heard about Jesus in Judea most likely. He might have heard uh, something about him at the Feast of the Passover if he were there for that. But that is not really enough information to, to know whether Jesus is the Son of God or any of those things. 
And it, uh, it also does not say how long Philip was talking to him, but I would submit that it probably is not a day or more that has passed. It's, it most likely seems to me to be hours based on the, the narrative that as they're riding along, they see some water. So you have to ask yourself, how much did the Ethiopian know? Do you know about Jesus? Do you know that the Bible teaches that He is the Son of God? If you, knew, if you know that, then the base knowledge of the Ethiopian when Philip started talking to him, you know more than him. And yet the Spirit sent Philip to preach to him. He didn't know that Isaiah 53 was about Jesus. A lot of the religious world, they, they know that Isaiah 53 is talking about Jesus because the New Testament points it out. If you know that, you know more than the Ethiopian knew at the beginning of this journey, so to speak. How much could Philip have told him about the entire Scripture in what seems like mere hours? I realize that Philip was a knowledgeable man in the Scriptures and that he was filled with the Holy Spirit, but there's only so much you can do in hours and so much that a person can take in. And so I'd submit to you that you probably know more than the Ethiopian did as he was baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. We talked about the Philippian jailer earlier, and I'm not going to read that passage again. But it seems like he is a Gentile, that he is uh, working for the Romans and keeping charge of a jail in Philippi. And so how much do you think he knew about Jesus? How much do you think he knew about the Old Testament scriptures? Little to none. And Paul and Silas did preach to him, but it, it does say in Acts 16 that he took him that very hour. And hour can, the, the word for hour doesn't necessarily have to mean hour, it can mean a certain set of time, but it wasn't the next day, it wasn't a week from then, it was that night. How much do you think he learned about the Bible in that time. How much did his household learn? And yet they were baptized that night and became disciples of Christ. Acts chapter 19 is another example of this. Acts 19 and verse 1. Acts 19 verse 1 says, It happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the upper country and came to Ephesus and found some disciples. He said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? No. And they said to him, No, we have not even heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, Into what then were you baptized? And they said, Into John's baptism. Paul says, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in Him who was coming after Him, that is, in Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And Paul, let, when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they began speaking with tongues and prophesying. They were in all about twelve men. So Paul meets some people here who are disciples of John. And they have only been baptized with the baptism of John the Baptist. Paul, he, he runs into them. They, it doesn't say how they begin to, to talk to one another. But he says, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you were baptized? And notice their response. They said, we have not, some, we have not even heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. Isn't that an odd thing to say? We, we take for granted that knowledge now, the, the, the Trinity as we call it, the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit, how they are all God. 
But if we're to take what they say at face value here, they don't even know who the Holy Spirit is and whether there is such a thing and such a person, I should say. And they only know the baptism of John. It doesn't even say that they knew Jesus. Paul preaches Jesus to them and uh, tells them that John pointed to someone coming after him and that they should believe in him. But it doesn't necessarily say that they knew about Jesus. And yet Paul tells them about Jesus and they recognize they need to be baptized in his name and they become disciples. I find it highly unlikely that a person in this day and age with how saturated in the Bible this culture is, that they don't know enough to be saved. And if they don't know enough, I can tell you that it doesn't take long to tell you what you need to know in order to be saved. How do I know that? Didn't take Paul long for the Philippian jailer. Didn't it seem to take Philip that long. Didn't seem to take long here for the disciples of John. And we need to understand, the coming of Christian does not mean, I have all knowledge now. I'm perfect. I've got everything under control in my, my life and my mind. That's not what being a Christian means. But rather, we see in the Scriptures that Christians continue to grow in knowledge once they have become disciples of Christ. Turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 3. Second Peter chapter 3 and verse, 7, uh, verse 17. Peter has just talked about how the world is going to be destroyed one day and that they need to be patient and wait for the coming of the day of the Lord. Verse 17, he says, You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, be on your guard so that you are not carried away by the error of unprincipled men and fall from your own steadfastness, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Peter says to these disciples, you already know some things. But continue to grow. Continue to grow in the Lord's grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Paul in Ephesians chapter 1 says this to the Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 15. Paul says, For this reason I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus which exists among you, and your love for all the saints, do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of Him. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of His calling, what are the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of His power toward us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of His might. <coughs> Paul says, I've heard of your faith. I've heard uh, about the, the things that you've done and your love for all the saints, but I'm still praying for you that you're going to keep growing, that you're going to be filled with more knowledge, that you're going to know more about the Lord Jesus and know about the hope of His calling and the riches of the glory of His inheritance and the surpassing greatness of His power. I want you to know more. I want the eyes of your heart to be enlightened. Christians, disciples of Christ, we keep growing in knowledge as we continue in the faith. Growing in knowledge... Honestly, there is far more growth, far, far more, seemingly an infinite amount more of growing in knowledge after you become a disciple than before you become a disciple. Don't say that you don't know enough. 
to become a disciple of Christ. Because when I read the Scriptures, it seems like essentially what they knew is that Christ died for their sins, was buried, was raised on the third day, and that He is Lord of heaven and earth. That He is the Messiah, the Anointed One, the Christ. And that you should give your life to Him. And that believing in Him, confessing your sins, repent, or confessing that He is Lord, repenting of your sins, and being baptized for the remission of your sins, that's how you become a disciple. That is how your sins are washed away. And to me, when I look at the Scriptures, that seems like more or less what they knew. And not much else in some cases. Don't put a stumbling block in your way that the Scriptures have not put there. Don't make an excuse when the Scriptures are trying to tell you to come to Jesus. And as we close this evening and we look at these excuses, and, and these are just four excuses that I've come up with, think of how many more excuses can be made, have been made, but also think about how they're not good excuses. There is no good excuse for turning away from following Jesus. Stop looking for reasons to not obey Jesus. Start looking for those reasons to obey Jesus. Because they are far more abundant and they are far more important. This evening, maybe you need to become a disciple of Christ. If you believe in Him, if you're willing to confess that before men, if you're willing to repent of your sins and be baptized for the remission of sins, you can make that happen tonight. And there is no excuse good enough that should stop you from doing it. If you are a Christian, but you have not been living the life that you should, there's no excuse for you to, to not make that right immediately. Again, these were excuses for really not beginning your walk with Christ, but a lot of them also apply to people who have walked away from their discipleship as well. Maybe you're saying, well, it's just not a convenient time for me to go forward. I've got too many things going on in my life. I, I need to sort them out, and then, then I'll come before the church. That's not how it works. You need the Lord to sort out the things in your life. You need your brethren to pray for you. And so if you have a need this evening, don't make excuses. Just come while we stand and sing.